Good day, folks. Welcome to another software overview video. Today, we're looking at Kubuntu 5.04, released on the 8th of April, 2005. Let's get into it. So for those who are not aware, Kubuntu is an official flavor of Ubuntu, which primarily uses the K desktop environment instead of the GNOME desktop environment. Obviously, this still holds true today with the most recent release being Kubuntu 1910 Eon Airmine. In case you ever wanted to figure out how the heck that was said, well, now you know. Kubuntu uses the same software repositories as Ubuntu, and on top of that, because its underpinnings are identical, it has a similar update scheme and a similar update schedule as regular Ubuntu. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, basically, you know when Ubuntu comes out with in this case, Ubuntu 1910 Eon Airmine, as of the making of this video, Kubuntu also got the same release around the same time, and it has a lot of the same similarities as far as improvements are concerned with the new Linux kernel, but we'll talk about that upon popular request or whatever have you. I guess if that's something that you all want me to make a video about. Now, the name Kubuntu obviously comes from the differentiating desktop environment, as you can obviously tell if I interact here. This looks nothing like your standard installation of Kubuntu, or Kubuntu, Ubuntu, rather. God, I can't even make this video. I apologize. I'm probably going to make that mistake quite a bit in this video. But uh, this was the big differentiating factor. A lot of the underpinnings were still the same. We'll get onto that as I go further in the video. But... K in the Ubuntu name, or Kubuntu name rather, just signified the desktop environment, which was KDE. Funnily enough, if you actually looked up the name of the word Kubuntu, the name itself still has the basic underpinnings of the name Ubuntu, which translates to toward humanity as a meaningful Bemba word. But coincidentally, if you also look up in the Kurundi language, the word Kubuntu takes the meaning of free. So I'm kind of glad that they don't actually charge money for this release because it would totally contradict its name, which, you know, I hope it forever stays that way because that's just kind of funny. And coincidental also, of course. Kubuntu was, I guess, quote, born on the 10th of December 2004 at the Ubuntu Matro conference in Matro, Spain. And this wasn't really an official release at that time. It was just kind of born by the developers of Ubuntu, I guess you could say, or whatever have you. Uh, canonical employee Andreas Moeller, or however, I guess how are you supposed to say that, from Nopix, or Genopix, however you're supposed to say that. I'm probably butchering a lot of Linux terms in this video, and I apologize for that, so please bear with me. I'm not a Linux master here. Andreas had the idea to make a deviation of Ubuntu, which used the K desktop environment instead of the GNOME 2 desktop environment that Ubuntu was using. And with the allowance from Mark Shuttleworth, the development started. And, you know, obviously we know who Mark Shuttleworth is. He's kind of like the main guy of Ubuntu. That same evening that the development started with Kubuntu, uh, two men joined the development project. There was Chris Halls from OpenOffice.org and Jonathan Riddell, or however you say his name, from KDE, also volunteered to the project, which makes sense because they wanted to make sure that the integration was very good. Even Mark Shuttleworth himself said, and I quote, I believe that the KDE community does phenomenal work, and having a community-driven distribution to showcase that work will help attract users and developers to the project. Our overall goal in the Ubuntu project is to further the adoption of free software on the desktop and the server, and we recognize that KDE is an essential part of the mix of desktop environments that allows people to find the best environment for their needs. And of course, that makes sense just because KDE in of course, Linux terms and Linux history, is one of the most recognized and probably one of the most popular desktop environments even to this day, which makes sense that a big open source distribution such as Ubuntu would want to make use of it. Now, getting back to the technical terms, now that we've talked about some of the underpinnings of the Kubuntu project itself, the first release of Kubuntu, Hori Hedgehog, otherwise known as 5.04, was released on the 8th of April, 2005 around the same time as Ubuntu 5.04 Hori Hedgehog, which I've already made a video about on my channel. If you want to go up here, I will have a card linking to that video. It's not of the best sound quality for my microphone, but everything else in that video is still persistent and still up to date as far as that distribution is concerned. So I'd highly recommend that you go watch that video if you want to understand more about the Ubuntu derivative of the same release. 
Now, KDE in and of itself at this time was on KDE or K Desktop Environment 3. And the initial release here of Kubuntu used version 3.4 as the default desktop environment version. And this was the default UI up until Kubuntu 8.04, which also included an unsupported option of using the then released KDE Plasma or KDE 4 as uh, I suppose some people might call it. And this was also later made the default in the next release, 8.10, which we'll also explore on this channel eventually once we get to it. Besides the K desktop environment being the most obvious addition, there was some other software that was included with this install of uh, Ubuntu, and some of the most useful KDE programs, which some people might recognize, such as Amarok, which is the music player, Caffeine, which is the media player, GWEN view or GWEN view as your image viewer, and K3B as your CD and DVD authoring application, or basically what we like to call as a CVD and DVD burner. Or at least that's how I like to call it. Some people might call it differently, but that's how I like to call it anyway. There were some other features that were carried into Kubuntu from Ubuntu, which included kickstart installation, dynamic frequency scaling for processors, which is basically an integration of Intel SpeedStep, for example. There was Hibernate and standby support. There was apt authentication and the ability to install the operating system from a USB device, such as a USB hard drive, flash drive, zip drive, whatever have you. This release of Kubuntu was supported up until the 31st of October 2006 from Canonical's previously used 18-month support cycle, which makes sense. Of course, they swapped to a 9-month support cycle later on in the operating system's life. That was the same for Ubuntu and all the other derivatives that were released, so it only makes sense that this got the same treatment. And with that having been said, Let's go ahead and take a look at the rest of the operating system, just to kind of get a look and see how everything is organized here. Now, obviously, this is the same desktop environment that you might see in other distributions that might use K desktop environment. And I believe one of them at that time included Debian, because uh, obviously Debian had all sorts of different software flexibility. It still does to this day, and it's one of the great uh, Linux versions that people tend to, like, I guess over but you know I'm not too crazy over it I just don't really use it so my opinions aside so let's take a look at some of the software that was noted in my notes such as Gwen view which is your image viewer and I apologize the VMware tools for some reason turned on some form of text scaling which is making everything all nice and big here for the video but it tends to make some things a little bit pixelated so I apologize ahead of time otherwise this would not be the case so um, sorry if things look a little unnatural. As far as Gwen View is concerned, on KDE 3.4.0, of course, as I mentioned, this is using version 1.2 of Gwen View, so that makes sense. I believe this is a, uh, still a current going project if you were to go to this link on SourceForge. I think that actually might still be the case today. Don't quote me on that, I haven't looked. But this is effectively like the Windows version of Irfan View, I think, or something like that, like Faststone Image Viewer, a couple of those kinds of things, not the inbuilt Windows software utilities. So uh, forgive me if they, I'm not quite right, but I'm close enough, I think, for the context of this video that I think it's okay. Of course, KDE comes with its own built-in set of uh, internet applications for desktop sharing, instant messaging, IRC chat, remote desktop, and of course a web browser, such as, in this case, Conqueror. Now at this time, Conqueror was actually both your web browser and your file browser, so a bit of a fun fact for you. And uh, obviously nowadays it is significantly obsolete and out of date. Of course the newer ones aren't nearly as bad, but this is obviously a 2005 web browser we're talking about here, specifically Conqueror 3.4.0, which uh, makes sense, and uh, yeah. I mean, you try to go to a website, let's just say bing.com, I've already tried it here. <laughs> Doesn't quite work, I don't think. And I don't suppose we're going to get an even better result with Google. Although, actually, in all fairness, it actually has a layout, and it actually works. Again, I'm apologizing for the obnoxiously large text scaling that VMware Tools set when I installed it. I don't know why I did that, but that's VMware Tools in a nutshell for you, and I didn't bother to change it before I started this video. I imagine it'll probably fix itself if I logged out and logged back in because, you know, X Windows. Here's another one of the inbuilt programs that came with Kubuntu, which is Amarok. And uh, 
you could basically think of this as like a, a music match jukebox competitor, but for Linux, and in this case specifically the KDE, and you can configure it all sorts of ways, like, you know, for example, you can have a single window with player and playlist functionality, or you can have a separated playlist view with a separated player in case you wanted to have a miniaturized view, kind of sort of like iTunes, but uh, you can have it standalone like that. Of course, you can scan through your directories to specifically point out if you have a folder full of music files, or it'll find them for you. And you can even change your database engine, uh, which is mainly based on SQL, which makes sense if you wanted to log into something like that to get your music files from there. So we'll just leave it on the single window configuration here, as you can see. And uh, what version is this? We're using Amarok 1.2.3. And uh, there you go. Seems like an easy enough interface to use. And the nice thing is you get a nice search bar up here so you can search through your music, very similar to that of iTunes. And I imagine that it works fairly similarly as such. And you get some options on the side for your music collection, playlists, any kind of media devices that might be detected, and your file browser. So, seems fairly intuitive. Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah, if you actually try to close this out, it will actually just minimize. So you'll have to go down here and actually right-click and hit quit if you want to close the program fully. And finally, there was the caffeine program. I accidentally triggered the dock there for a minute. So let's go ahead and launch that. So here is the installation check. Of course, we're not able to play Windows Media 9 files because I wasn't able to download the updates. I'll talk about that in a later video in case anybody's interested. Uh, my iMac doesn't have a DVD drive, so that's why that error is thrown up. But it's not like it's going to like throw anything off majorly. Wow, that is one massive heading. <laughs> Jeez. But uh, interestingly, this carries like a similar-ish, not really, layout to that of the older Windows Media Players, like pre-Windows Media Player 7, if anybody has a vibe on that. That's kind of what that reminds me of. This is Caffeine Player 0 0.6. And I don't have anything to play with this utility, so we'll just have to leave it at that. Of course, the icon, based on its name, is of a coffee bean, so that's pretty creative on them. And let's go ahead and find K3B. I think it's under system. No. What would K3B be under? Oh, it's under uh, multimedia as well. So here's K3B. Of course, I don't have a DVD drive, so it's going to error out on me, but that's fine. So here's the K3B software, which you can use. It's basically like Nero, but for Linux, it makes sense that um, it has all these different features. This version of K3B is 0 0.11.23. And that's that. I mean, if you've used Nero or Power2Go or something like that, you'll know exactly what that is. There's some other things on here, too. Of course, OpenOffice was a fairly big one because, as I mentioned from my notes, OpenOffice got affiliated with the Kubuntu project early on to make a compatible release for this operating system. And as you can see, here it is. So if you've used... Ubuntu 5.04, this is the exact same release on Kubuntu, so there you go. Released copyright for some reason in 2003, even though the OS was released in 2005, which I always found funny. I think they fixed that if you ran your updates, which I actually can't for some reason because of some weird networking thing or some apt issue, but either way, that still works. And one thing we'll do, because I find it pretty funny, we'll go into the control center here, which is basically a control panel, but for the K desktop environment. And I apologize for this text scaling. I have to expand stuff out quite a bit. But this is effectively your grand control panel. And there's always a funny thing about the uh, sound part of this, but we'll come back to that. But we'll take a look at some of these settings here, such as the KDE components. We can start looking at KDE performance, and you can start... Uh, going through the settings in here and having a ball. Interestingly, this icon is like pulled straight from Windows XP, which is pretty funny. I know it's not the exact same icon, but it just looks very similar. And you can configure all sorts of different things. You got internet things in here, which is always fun. I believe this allows you to, yeah, you can look at your uh, IP addresses and everything like that. Um, it's also got a bunch of wireless configuration settings, which is good because at this time, wireless uh, connectivity was getting to be pretty popular. So it's nice to see that stuff in there. 
I believe that also supports, I think, WPA or WPA2 of some kind. Don't quote me on that, but I might be right on that. There's also some laptop settings, but obviously I'm on an iMac, so that's not going to apply to me. And security. Apparently there's also a wallet application. This still applies today, I believe. If you've ever connected to a Wi-Fi network on modern Kubuntu, it always comes up with this wallet application that wants to create a password for the wallet to store your Wi-Fi passwords. Every single time I've ever tried to connect to a new Wi-Fi network with a new install of Kubuntu, this always seems to come up. But uh, it's good to see that there is some form of settings in here from back in the day. You can also use all these different settings and whatnot. I'm just rambling at this point if you haven't noticed, but just to give you a bit of a look at some of the stuff that came with this OS when it was new, just not glazing over my notes and just calling it a video. Now, Kubuntu did actually ship with some very nice sounds, and I don't know how well it's going to actually pick up on the video. I'm actually going to disconnect my headphones here real quick so that we can get a good uh, glimpse of some of these sound effects. Now, there are three different startup sounds, and there are three different log off sounds. We'll play the defaults first before we actually go into the two other sounds. So this will be your main startup sound that you would hear when you'd log on to the computer. It actually sounds really cool. When I installed this for the first time in a virtual machine a long time ago, it was actually many months ago that I took a look at this operating system. I thought that was the coolest sounding startup sound, and I actually wish I could convert it from the .ogg to a .wav file or something and use it on an old Windows computer as a login sound because it's just that cool, you know, nostalgia. But like I mentioned, there are two others, so we'll go ahead and go with KDE underscore startup underscore two, and we'll hear how that sounds next. So there's that startup sound, and here is the last startup sound. I don't know why, but I find the classic KDE sounds really cool sounding. Now, of course, with the login sounds, there are log off sounds, and here we have an example of the default. It's pretty simple. Nothing fancy, but there are two more, so let's go ahead and listen to another one. There's that one, and here's the last one. Short, sweet, and to the point. Now, there's, unlike, I guess, some other uh, defaults, there are some error sounds. Some of them are kind of interesting sounding, like this one. I don't know if it's trying to resemble like the Windows XP critical stop, which I guess would make sense. There's this one here. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the chimes. Like we heard earlier, or at least I did. You might not have. And then the glass break. This is kind of the uh, sound. It's actually fairly accurate, too. And the sounds themselves are actually fairly high quality. Like They don't have any noticeable distortion to them. So I'm really surprised. Other than that, I don't believe there's too much else for me to show, but we'll take a quick look at some other stuff like Contact, for example, which is the inbuilt uh, mail application. This is actually a GNOME application. It has a different mouse cursor. Or at least it seems to, because it doesn't use the same exact mouse cursor as KDE. It uses the GNOME mouse cursor, which is interesting enough. Or at least the loading symbol from it. There's some other things in here, of course. There's a floppy formatter because back in the day we actually still used floppy disks. Uh, Kate is kind of like your uh, notepad of sorts, or I guess you could also call it a WordPad, but this is more notepad than WordPad, but I guess it's up to your preference what you'd like to call it. And finally, let's take a look at some other stuff, like there's also Juke built into the system. I think this actually came with KDE as the uh, package of sorts but Amarok was included as a compatible application that many people would probably prefer over Juke, but I could be wrong on that. Yes, I want to quit. Now, what's also cool about Kubuntu, at least in this early release, is that it has an example of virtual desktops. So for example, we have Conqueror here open on this desktop. 
we can go to another desktop and say open up contact there. We can then go to another desktop and say open up uh, openoffice.org. And we can go to another desktop and open up the media player application, which I'm not sure. I think it's opening up something else, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, it looks like it's opening up another instance of this spreadsheet application. Can we not? Also, I wanted to take note of this bouncing icon, which has been a staple of KDE ever since a while. I couldn't tell you exactly where this was implemented, but it's always been a staple of the K desktop environment, at least in what I've noticed previously. So um, I think I remember when they removed that, they had like the icon next to the mouse cursor in the more modern releases, but it doesn't actually bounce. So I'm not sure when they changed that or removed that feature. Anyway, um, let's just try Gwenview here for this last one. So as you can see, now we can switch between all of these desktops whenever we wish. This was a very big feature back in the day, especially given the limited resources that many computers had, such as less than one gigabyte of RAM, which was fairly commonplace on laptops back before Windows Vista's main day release. So get out of here, that doc. So this was a very, very powerful feature that only Windows got in 2015, of course, and Mac OS has had ever since the days of spaces. What I wanted to show in this video was the login screen. As you can see, this is a fairly basic screen. You can pick your session types down here, whether you have a fail safe or the full desktop environment in case you might have set something wrong. And you can kind of get a glimpse down there also of the default KDE wallpaper that would otherwise ship with the operating system. But in this case, it has a Kubuntu thing on there. And there's some other things down here, such as switching users, remote login, console login, or you can shut down the computer as well. But this is just basically something that I wanted to show real quick. And also before I go, we'll go and log back in here. If I type my password correctly, that might be a beneficial thing if I don't double press my keys. Kubuntu actually came with Quite a number of wallpapers built in, unlike nowadays where, or at least from a time, they actually didn't. Of course, these are nothing fancy. These are essentially kind of like the Windows 2000 or 98 style wallpapers where they're tiled and low resolution, but when they're actually tiled, they actually look like something else. Well, here we go. Here's one. Uh, it's got the K desktop environment on it. Can we actually scale that one? Um, something like that. Good res or sorry, a good aspect ratio. <laughs> um, there's Aurora. It's kind of slow because I don't exactly have a lot of resources dedicated to this VM, but as you can see, looks pretty cool, I would say. There's a couple more tiled ones, such as uh, the black marble there. Let's see what this blue blend looks like. Oh, that looks kind of nice, actually. Okay, I could roll with that one, I could see. There's a Celtic, there's another tiled one, there's Circuit. Kind of gives you the Macintosh System 7.5 vibes there. Default blue for some reason. Why isn't this the default wallpaper? This looks really good. I mean, I guess they didn't have the Kubuntu wallpaper on it. Okay, fair enough. Or maybe this was the default for KDE 3.4 when you did a clean install. So maybe that's the case. Um, there's also some other nice wallpapers in here like the KDE Dragon which <laughs> looks pretty looks pretty fun. Of course that's still their mascot to this day if anybody was curious. There's the default Kubuntu wallpaper. Let that one out. Just the K. And then uh, interesting Sea of Canero. What's this? Oh, it's somebody's early digital photograph. Okay, cool. Uh, what's another photograph that looks kind of cool? Here we go. Triple gears. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's an early 2000s wallpaper there. Actually, in this case, mid-2000s. A lot of tiled wallpapers, though. I'll, I'll say that much. Um, gear flowers. What's this? If I stretch this one out. Um, oh, God. My VM is lagging. Uh, my VM is lagging for some reason. There we go. Oh, this is actually pretty high resolution. That's probably why it took forever. How high resolution is that Gear Flowers picture? I wanna, I wanna take a look at that real quick. Just out of curious. 
Gear flowers. Oh, these are dot SVG files. That also might be contributing to that. So uh, anyway, um, it doesn't really say in this properties thing. Can I open that in Conquer? Because I want to actually see what the resolution would be. Let's go throw that path into Conquer here. And uh, wonder what it'll tell me. Oh, that's kind of cool. I can get into there. That's pretty neat. Um, it doesn't really, um, doesn't really show too much. I would assume that it'll just scale based on the resolution of the monitor. But you got to admit, that actually looks really cool. But with that having been said, that's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed watching and stay tuned for some more looks at uh, old Kubuntu versions. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> God, I can't mean in my own video. I apologize. But anyway, that's it for this uh, video, guys. I will see you all in the next one.